Hello and welcome to the Modern Fairy Sightings podcast, where we listen to people's fairy encounters. But take heed, we're not talking about winged tinkerbells here. These are real fairies, real encounters that took people like you and I by surprise. Stay a while and hear their stories. My name is Joe Hickey Hall and I'm a folklore researcher. Hello dear listener, I hope you're well. We are between series at the moment and this bonus episode is a recording of a talk I recently gave in October 2021 at the Glastonbury Fairy Fair. I talk about how I got into this research and what the Modern Fairy Sightings Project is all about. I'm afraid the sound quality isn't great, but I've done my best to make it listenable. Thanks to all those contacting me with their experiences and I look forward to talking to you in the coming weeks and months. And thank you to my amazing curious crew of Patreon supporters. If you're enjoying the show and you're able to support the project, please join us at patreon.com, the Modern Fairy Sightings podcast, and receive all sorts of exclusive unheard content and merchandise. Keep an eye on my scarletofthefay.com website too, where I'll be releasing the Modern Fairy Sightings shop very soon. If you're interested in inviting fae experiences through ritual ceremony, we have a patron-only workshop event coming up in January, with a previous guest who will take us through this step by step. So join us soon if you'd like to take part in that. I'll be releasing another bonus episode on December the 12th and Series 3 will launch on 2nd of January 2022. I hope you enjoy the talk. Let me know your own thoughts on all of this at scarletofthefay.com. Much love and remain curious. Or, 
because you're frightened of the repercussions of keeping that berries. The group now has about four and a half thousand members, and it was always um, well. I, I kind of close it from time to time because I want to maintain a sense of community there. I want people to feel that it's a safe space to talk freely. So if anyone's being rude or you know um, dismissive of people's experiences, then they get chucked out. With no question, if they're just out because. You know, it's really important that people feel that this is their space. So some people aren't ready to share, and, and that's okay. And, and sometimes, um, you know, that may change over time, or it might not. They might never decide to share, and that's fine. You know, it, ha it has to feel right for you to share your experience. But uh, for lots of other people, they go there to read the accounts because it's so important to know that you're not the only one. I think if you seen a fairy, people don't talk about that and you can sometimes feel that you're alone with that and so it really helps to kind of validate uh, their own experience and kind of assimilate it for them. So in a deeper way, the podcast provides a space for guests to tell their experiences in their own words first hand. And I, I know this is important because I've had my own fairy experience. So I'll tell you about that shortly. But my relationship with fairies kind of starts way back when I was really young with my Irish father who would tell me all time stories. So he passed away unexpectedly about seven years ago, just as we moved to Bristol. So I received a scholarship to study a Master's in History at the University of Bristol with Professor Ronald Cotton. Um, but as a young child, my dad would tell me stories about children who would love playing with a hoop and stick as he did in 1930s rural Cork when he was born, and they would get carried away playing, and suddenly they would find that maybe they got separated from their friends, or they were somewhere that they didn't recognise, and they weren't sure how to get home, and of course it would be coming into twilight, and they wouldn't recognise you know, the surroundings, and suddenly they would happen upon a fairy court, or a fairy ring, and they would feel, even though they had ringing in their ears, the warnings from their friends and family, you know, to wear the fairy rings, um, they would feel compelled to sit down in a room of darker green grass that was different to the rest. And they, as they would sit there, of course, they would go off on a journey into the other worlds, um, having these adventures and these fairies. And then at some point, they would suddenly come to and they were sitting on that green, dark ring. And they would just think that it was they dreamt the whole thing and and now it was easy for them to find their way home. So I was really, you know, I, I guess at the time I took those bedtime stories for granted. And I thought that every other child was treated to the same kind of stories at bedtime. And then when I grew too old for those bedtime stories, I just simply reflected that, you know, how great it was to have such an imaginative father, but then about five years ago, I found out that those stories had actually been passed down our family through generations. Um, and Hiki, my surname, over Keda, um, it's an old, ancient Irish surname. So that was quite exciting. Um, and so I like to think that fairies are in my blood in some way. But um, I wasn't particularly interested in fairies growing up. Um, I did enjoy Sister Mary Barker's Blackberry books, which my mum owned. But um, I was always more interested in the unseen and the unexplained. You know, lots of tips on these things and facts and all sorts of strange, strange incidents. And um, I knew innately that the world was a much more mysterious than we had been led to believe. And I never did really understand why people seemed to pretend that it wasn't. In my mid teens, I dabbled with pedigree and crystals and tarot, and eventually in my late teens I started to attend workshops with this amazing woman who was, um, she's in her 60s by then, um, but she had been there at the forefront of the New Age movement, and um, she taught us meditation, healing, uh, dancing, how to see auras, heart flower remedies, and she also performed past life regressions. So, one great time, out of class, she just casually mentioned that she had once seen a fairy. And I just thought, well, how ridiculous. Why has she seen that? 
And I, I just couldn't, I couldn't comprehend it. I, I, I had a real, you know, issue with that because I just thought, you know, it just couldn't possibly uh, be true. And, you know, that's kind of interesting that I was willing to accept all of these ideas and techniques and learnings, and yet that was just a step too far for me at the time. But then, out of the blue, about 10 years later, I did see the fairy. And um, so I'd only recently met the man that I was to marry, and um, no one else was around, and we went off to watch the sun go down and we went to the weird uh, location. And uh, we you know, had a bit of a and it was um, quite a bit chilly and you know, the twilight set in, we had it together. And I felt compelled to turn around, and behind us, about sort of five to eight metres away, was this little green man. Now he was all sorts, all kinds of shades of green, but he was about two and a half, three foot high, and he was looking right at me. And I had this kind of sense that he'd actually been watching us before I saw him. And he was looking at me with these curious eyes as I was looking at him. And I, you know, I couldn't quite fathom what was happening in that moment, but we continued to keep eye contact. And then I must have blinked or looked away, and he was gone. He had a really friendly face, it was very open, but his skin was ancient. And when I say ancient, it's like every single space on his face was filled with lines. He had quite a dark, sort of leathery kind of looking skin, and beautiful, uh, open eyes that he was regarding me with. Um, and there was a kind of friendliness about him. He never smiled, but, um, you know, there was no, I wasn't frightened at all, and there was a sense of friendliness, friendliness about him. Um, and the main sense I received from that experience was that he wanted me to see him. That's what I came away with. So, we've only been together about six months at the time. I didn't tell my husband, because um, I thought he'd think that I was mad. And um, I was still making sense of it myself, but I hadn't really assimilated it. So, I, I said nothing. But the funniest thing happened. Uh, when we got up to leave a short time later. So it was getting, it was actually really dark by this point, and we had to get back to the car. Um, and as we walked along to, to, kind of, to get back to the car, there was quite a long grass to the left of us. And as we walked, something in the grass was walking. We couldn't see anything there, but my husband got quite spooked and started quickening his pace. And as he did, whatever it was, it was a good pace. So then we started running, and I, I knew. Um, you know, I knew what it was, and I, I was laughing because I thought this is just so cheeky and stupid. And you know, they were having a grand old time of teasing us, basically, which is so typical. Now I realise it's just so typical of those. Um, so um, I did, I did eventually tire him some time later. But after it happened, um, I didn't really have anyone to talk to about it. So I went along to this guy that I thought would know. And hopefully we've all got something in our lives that we might be able to seek advice from in these kind of situations. And um, so it took me a few times, a few visits to kind of pack up the courage to tell him. And um, so I did, and he, he just laughed and said, ah, oh, you're not the only one. So um, this was very interesting. And um, I also uh, was able to tell my, my friend, who was kind of really into lots of different things. You know, we could talk cheese together and his meditation and things like that. And so I told her, and she just said, oh, no, I'm sorry. I don't believe that you saw his fairy. I think it's really lovely that you think you did. But I'm sorry, I don't, I don't believe that, that it's possible. So, no. Okay. <laughs> you know, she had the same disbelief as, as I had originally had as well. Healing has helped me many times in my life when I'd reached a point where something needed to change. In 2005, I trained with Martin Broffman to learn the body mirror system of healing, which was life-changing for me. It's based on the idea that the parts of your body that don't work well reflect the parts of your life that don't work well, and about which you have tension in your consciousness. The understanding is that tension is stress, and stress causes symptoms. In a distance healing or in-person session, I move up the chakras, returning each one to wholeness using a colour map. 
During the process, I see images and situations. I hear words or receive impressions that tell me something about what caused the tension in that person's life. The feedback at the end of the session is a really big part of the healing. If you're interested in a chakra healing session, you can contact me at scarletofthefay at gmail.com. But I had a call from that friend just after I moved to Bristol, and she was really excited, and she said, oh, I need to tell you something. Um, my friend, this, this woman that she knew, she said, she's seen something really similar, and it was in the same place. So now she was willing to believe that it was possible that we had seen what we had seen. So I was kind of joked with her that clearly I wasn't sensible enough in her eyes for her to take mine. <laughs> but, you know, it's okay to take me a bit more. <laughs> so, you know, that kind of response is fairly typical because, you know, to the idea of fairies being real. And um, as my co author Mark always put it, there's a kind of sliding spectrum when it comes to belief in supernatural or extraordinary encounters. So, at one end of the spectrum, we've got ghosts. And ghosts are a fairly respectable experience to have. You know, we all. Um, we know that we'll die, we have an idea that, you know, that maybe life goes on afterwards, maybe it's pure spirit, and so we can kind of get our heads around ghosts. Then we get to UFOs, which are you know, a bit more weird, and um, you know, we, although, although it's still quite, quite a strange concept for a lot of people, we can all look to the sky, see the planets, and then imagine that it's quite possible that we're not the only life forms in the universe. Um, and then, you know, in the same way, people are kind of opening up more to the idea of Bigfoot, Sasquatch, it, because there's these great vast, you know, wildernesses where potentially some life may exist that we don't know about yet. Um, but when it comes to fairies, it's kind of always stood on its own, really. It's just too mind blowing for people to comprehend. Um, you know, they start to think, well, you know, if fairies are real, where are these worlds? Are they there all the time? Are they being watched? You know, why don't we have any knowledge of this? And if this is real, then what else don't we know about? And so it kind of counters our understanding of the mundane world that we live in. So for the last five years have thrown everything we thought we knew about the world into complete chaos. And the polarization of politics and the uprising of climate, global emergencies, um, you know, followed by the fears about COVID and prolonged lockdowns, and you know, also appears that we're experiencing a complete breakdown of the media um, as we've known it. So these previously informed our worldview, whereas now people are getting their information from you know, independently from alternative sources on the internet and deciding what feels true to them. So the lines of reality are blurred. You know, and it's, it's global and it's unprecedented. But perhaps we ourselves are in between worlds at the moment, in the liminal space. And uh, the other thing to note is that during lockdown, a lot of people, you know, not everybody, but a lot of people were able to go out and experience nature in a way that maybe they hadn't previously for a long time, or maybe not ever. Um, and they found a lot of meaning and solace in that relationship. In a lot of cases, it, it kind of caused them to slow down and see the world through a different lens than they usually might have done. Uh, it gave them clarity during a traumatic time. So through this developing relationship with nature, uh, perhaps more people are opening to the idea of other worlds now and the beings that exist within them. So supernatural entities who are able to transcend into our reality, vice versa, as we visit their realms, it certainly seems so. Because, you know, people are talking about these things and there's like a myriad of new groups online where people are talking about these things. So it's quite an exciting time. So for my very exciting podcast, for people to share their first hand encounters and for, for other people to be able to go to and listen. So it's not about convincing people that there is a real. You know, it's not my concern what other people choose to believe. That's their business, and um, but for people like me and others who've had fairy encounters, it's a source and can be a real source of comfort as well, and to meet with others. For people like me who've had these encounters, you want to get past the 
are they aren't they real debates because we just want to exchange uh, you know details about encounters and talk about what it feels like when you see a fairy. But I do ask all of my guests to reflect really deeply on whether it feels right to share, as I say, because, um, you know, if, if it doesn't, then just leave it and, and just see what happens. But go with your gut, go with your gut feeling on it. And the other thing is that um, it's completely anonymous, so I never reveal the names of the people, and I also never ever reveal the location. And the reason is because, you know, I don't want people to carry the. Harry Hunter. Harry Hunter. Harry Hunter. Harry Hunter. That could be a good band name. Um, okay. <laughs> no, going off into the environment and sort of, you know, going to these last vegetable vestiges of nature where, you know, we really need to protect these environments and also protect the beings that, that reside there. So, um, that's like a massive concern for me, and I always feel very responsible about that. So you'll never hear where these exciting are taking place. Um, so, so far, there'll be about 24 episodes in the podcast, and several more due to be released, and they show a variety of encounters. So, I'm going to share with you some of the encounters now. As you'll hear, you know, uh, some of them in particular are uh, particularly compelling because, well, I think they're all compelling, but for skeptics, um, some of them are particularly interesting because they're seen by more than one person at the same time, right? So, um, you know, and interest, interestingly, we tend to imagine fairies being outside, but about a third of the encounters that have been shared on the podcast have taken place in it. So, in one of the earlier episodes, a woman walked into her kitchen to find a tiny fairy, a few inches tall, stuck to her flypaper. And um, it managed to get itself free and fly out of the window just before her friend came in the door behind her. It was quite funny because she'd already seen this fairy outside, and it had been it come from a planter outside where there was loads of ivy, and it had flown from the ivy up to a really a tall tree. It had done so so quickly. Um, it moved not like an insect at all. It swooped and zoomed up there, and in that time, her friend had just missed it. And it just happened again when she saw this, either the same fairy or a very similar looking one in the house. She had this idea that maybe it was going for the honey which was on the window, window sill. And um, so that was in Seattle, Washington. And that's the first time she'd been aware that there were fairies on the property, but she'd, she'd lived, her family had lived there for you know, a few generations. So that was quite interesting for her. So in another case, a man in the UK told how as a little boy, he used to love sitting up in bed, reading, you know, with his knees drawn up, his book on his, on his knee. And he had a sense of something, so he let his knees drop down, and there, at the end of the bed, was this little fairy man. And um, he said he was about a foot tall, he was white bearded and had a kind face, and he just looked at him and said, hello. And this little boy just completely froze, and he jumped out of bed, and he kind of went to the edge of his room, paused, looked back, the fairy was still there, and so he ran into his, understandably, into his mother's room, but he never felt able to tell her, you know, the little boy. And, um, yeah, he kind of regretted not, not staying there and speaking to the, the little man, because he did feel that there was no mercy there and he was just being friendly, but as a child, we can totally understand why he had that reaction. Another indoor sighting involved a group of really cheeky fairies who descended on a young woman while she was in bed. So she was there, she'd actually had a particularly awful experience with a nasty goblin uh, character who had been in her room previously and she'd seen him off. And um, so she's lying in bed, she looks over and there's this troop of fairies on her dressing table and they came tumbling and running over to her, jumped in the bed and tickled her until she fell asleep. So this is a really lovely experience and she said that it kind of made up in some way for the whole goblin that she'd seen previously. And in Central Europe, uh, a woman recalls sitting in the kitchen of her parents' house with her sister and their two young babies. And as they're sitting there drinking coffee and chatting, they suddenly both saw this form of figure in the doorway, but it looked as if it was kind of coming across the doorway. So it never fully manifested, 
And as a trained psychologist, she left into professional mode and uh, she arranged with her sister that they wouldn't talk anymore about it. They would each separately speak with their mother and tell their mother the story and then they would kind of check to see afterwards. And they both gave the exact description of exactly where it had formed in the doorway, the height and the shape. Um, you know, their testimonies match. So it's these kind of it's these kinds of shares that do allow for kind of a deep research really. So another factor which comes up time and again is the informant reporting uh, eye contact with the area. And you know, eyes are said to be the windows to the soul. So having experienced them, I can testify that it does feel like a potentially life-changing experience when you look eyes at another human being. Um, in a podcast interview so far, about two thirds have featured eye contact, which is quite amazing really. And in one instance, two women were making their way to a midsummer ritual. Now this was in a really big UK park. Um, they were heading over to a certain place where the ritual was taking place. And uh, they came across a small pixie coming from the opposite direction on the same path as them. And he's running, running along, and he looks at them, nods, they nod back at him, and he just carries on. And they said that um, he was wearing sort of Victorian working men's clothes, and a brown food jacket, buckled shoes and pointy hat, little beard, round face. But she mentioned his sparkling brown eyes quite a few times when she was sharing that. And she said to her friend at the time, Did you see that pixie, pixie man? And he said, Yes. And then they just he very much of that and they just carried on to their ritual. So that was a really great that was a really great one. In another encounter in Alberta, Canada, a woman out for a walk with a member of her family decided to take off by herself and practice her calming, which is uh, an ancient pretty hall. And so she describes hearing her call sung back to her. She said it sounded like it was sung through something like a tunnel, but she'd never fully describe exactly what that was. She said that it had a beautiful pitch which matched hers, but it was also unique in its own way. It wasn't her voice. Fear initially set in and she thought that maybe a camper had followed her to that remote location, so she was a bit worried about that. But then she said she was kind of overcome with a sense of knowing and she scrambled down a steep verge to uh, investigate and see where the voice was coming from. But then she got this sense that she really wasn't welcome and that she was somewhere that she shouldn't be, so she immediately tried to scramble back up the verge again. So out of breath, at the top, she turns around to look back at this thicket of the trees there and she saw halfway up a tree about her height this little face looking back at her with its little fingers wrapped around the trunk of the tree. She said it's a triangular face, the skin was a yellowish brown, the hair was dark mass of brown, the nose was very small, the mouth wide, with thin lips, and she described its eyes like dark almondine garments, full of depth. From the little being came a faint gasp and then it disappeared. And she relayed feeling afterwards like she was given a real blessing in that day and that she it was to encourage her to continue being loving and positive. In another share, a woman from Australia describes an encounter from the age of around three. So she's out walking with an adult and she came across a tree that was glowing like phosphorescence. And um, it was full of these little red flying beings, about an inch and a half tall and they were possibly all female. So one of them seemed to be directing, and this one came right down to her face, about uh, an inch away, and um, she had red dragonfly, dragonfly on her covered in like a faintly ribbed, um, her skin was kind of faintly ribbed, and her bodysuit was slightly, slightly more ribbed. But she was almost like she was wearing a stocking bodysuit. With two sets of wings, and, um, her iris, she said her irises were red and her pupils were black. She had long red eyelashes that very fluttered in front of her with some kind of sense of purpose. She wasn't smiling or frowning, she just looked impassive. They remained there observing each other for about 10 seconds and then it flew off and it actually um, got the rest of the fairies to fly through it. So the adult woman that was with her at the time said to her, Did you see what? 
to just keep that going. And the what was interesting is that the adult woman later in life became a born again Christian, and um, at that point she decided that the fairies that she'd seen were clearly demons, and that it was a message from the devil. And whereas the little girl grew up uh, with a sense of strength imparted to her, she felt that 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 fairy gave her a real sense of inner power that day. So it was a really positive experience for her. It's interesting about the adult woman that had seen it because she wasn't able to completely discount it because she knew that the little girl had seen it too. So she wasn't able to tell herself that she'd imagined it. The only way that she could make sense of it was that it was real, but it was wrong. Um, so that's quite an interesting psychology there as well. So now all of these have been positive experiences. Um, but there have been some really frightening ones too, and I won't talk about uh, those here today in case anyone is kind of sensitive around that subject. But what I can uh, share with you is this particular one, which isn't too scary. Um, so there's a woman driving back from a, a teaching a late class in, in rural Canada, and about five minutes from where she lives, she saw something come up out of the ditch on the left. She thought it was a deer because she saw the flash of eyes, and it looked about that time height. But as it stepped up out of the ditch and she slowed down, the headlights uh, you know, are beaming on it as it walks across the road. It was stood upright. It was about four feet tall and it was looking dead at her, looking her right in the eye. She's in a huge big truck that didn't seem to be frightened of her whatsoever. Uh, she said the way it moved, she said the arms didn't move at all, unlike the demon. Its skin was a dark brown and the eyes looked very human. But larger, and the mouth was pushed forward, uh, kind of like a puff box, but more pronounced. She said it had some kind of hair all the way down its back, which looked like a mane, and from behind actually looked like an animal. Um, it carried on walking across the headlights, as I said, holding her gaze and really taking its time. And she really felt like it was a sort of quite, quite threatening manner. Um, and then it stepped into a ditch on the right hand side and disappeared in the cornfield. She describes receiving the impression that she shouldn't be there or that she'd opened a door into something, you know, some world that she wasn't supposed to open. Um, she was really worried about an aftermath, but nothing ever did happen. And she says to this day, if she's passing a cornfield, she just won't look. So it's interesting that so many of the encounters feature these, this eye contact. Uh, because to see into the fairy realm and fairy folklore is this great taboo. And many do end up, who do see, end up losing an eye and becoming blind in some other way. In lots of stories, the seer is a midwife. And the midwife is compelled to assist with a uh, fairy lady. So the role of the midwife itself is already minimal. She's standing at the gate between the worlds. One famous story called the fairy infant was, was based in Tavistock in Devon. And a nurse is taken by fairies to serve a mother and baby, and she's provided with some ointment to rub into the baby's eyes. After her assigned time with, in the fairy kingdom, she stays there for a year, and she returns home and unintentionally brings this pot of ointment with her. She rubs it where she inadvertently gets some of her left eye and she's able to see into the fairy realm. Hearing of this, the fairy king blinds her in that eye. In other stories, the fairy seers have their eyes gouged out, poked at, and it's also present in some early collective uh, encounters by the likes of 20th, early 20th century folklorists like Owen Wentz. So it appears that these stories were to warn us away from involving ourselves in any way with fairies. We're not meant to see these worlds. But as much as it's socialised out of us in the West, could it be innately within us to see them? In other cultures like Kampa and Peru, they accept that unseen being, beings live alongside us. So was that the case for us too at one time? One recent encounter which I shared on the podcast was from a woman in Wales who was one day sitting in the field near her home. And she was relaxing and taking in the view and she was just thinking to herself, I wonder what this landscape was like at one time. And at that moment, she sees a group of people ride by with mosses in medieval clothes. She immediately thought to herself, they're not people, they're fairies. 
noticing a long velvet Lord and Lady Guard and these deep hues of velvet. She said, why are they dressed like that? And then Arthur came back. This is what we looked like the last time you could see us. So if it was once natural for us to see fairies, I just wonder, has that time come again? Interestingly, people report a sense of awe throughout their sharing of encounters, alongside the feeling that it is just a natural thing to see them. The first encounter shared on the podcast was from a man who was um, taking some time out in the remote highlands of Scotland. Now, he was on his way home from the pub, he swears he only had a pint or two of his pine chips, and um, he saw something run across the track from left to right, so he got a good clear view, a you know, good few seconds, and uninterrupted, and it was human shaped, and about four foot, very pale skin, and gangly limbs. It ran away, looking at him over its right shoulder, as it did, and it, he said it was like a wild animal that had been startled. He described it as being like any other wildlife sighting. So this is something I hear again and again, and it's something I felt when I had my own fairy experience. I wasn't frightened, it was just a really beautiful moment in which I felt like I glimpse of nature. Um, so often people report some kind of fascinating side effect of having a fairy encounter. They might experience a life transition of some sort, or feel like they've received a blessing in some way, long-held dreams coming to pass, like buying a house that they've always wanted, or suddenly they're able to conceive when they couldn't before. For other people, they become really passionate about environmentalism. Um, and for others, it just kind of sparks an interest to look into, you know, put them on a path to seek to understand the workings of this world, this universe, and how, how it functions. And so, you know, in my view, we may not ever find the answers, but the important thing is that we learn by sharing these experiences and keep talking about them. And so we're forming ideas and we're getting a glimpse of, you know, some general possibilities um, and those musings may shift and they should do because I think we all need to keep an open mind about things and, you know, keep listening to informants, um, sharing ideas with other researchers and just kind of not taking like a firm position really. We've got to sort of pull together. I think each story brings its own perspective to the table. So we've got to we've got to remember that that it's always, you know, it's always moving, you know, it's not going to stay in one place. Um, I think what we can say is that there is just such a massive body of evidence now that we can say that, you know, something is happening. Something is happening. And um, that these beings, in some way that we don't understand, exist in some kind of parallel world to ours, um, and that we can potentially access these or see these beings through altered states. Um, you know, those can be through meditation, they can be through ritual, or you know, some people take psychedelic substances. There's just so many different ways in which we can um, access altered states. Sometimes it's just a heightened sense of emotion. But, you know, there are just several different ways to make contact with beings, really, and have to find your own way with it. My chosen medium is meditation, and I like ritual too. And more recently, I've got interested in tea ceremonies. So, this was a guest that I had on the show, and uh, he introduced me to this concept of using neural teams to connect with the spirit world. And um, I'm really, yeah, I'm really interested in this, and it's something actually that with, um, I'm not allowed to go on to, but on the Patreon group, and um, we're going to we're get him to give us a, um, a workshop on it, because I just want to know more, I can try it out myself now, I'm really interested. So, you know, these simple techniques, you know, meditation is freely available for everybody, and, you know, it's life enriching. So, even if you don't connect with our worldly beings, you'll connect with your own deep spirit of who you truly are, you'll learn about yourself, through the meditation or the rituals, and as they say, know yourself. You know, it's paramount if you're embarking on any kind of journey to any sort of wisdom or knowledge, you need to know yourself, and so it's a really good place to start with meditation. But my own 
decision to begin the podcast came through meditation and it was a really consistent message to just get on with it and even though I had these niggling doubts about I'm not really a technical person, I don't really know how to do this, but this persistent message through meditation was just, just go for it, just do it. And I'm so glad I did because it fit, it's so meaningful to me, it, it really does mean everything to me and I feel really honoured to be able to share these stories with others, to, to hear them and to provide a space for amazing guests to come on and, and tell people about what they've experienced. And, you know, I've always said that I'll continue as long as it feels right. So I'm always checking back in and meditating to see if, you know, regularly, to, to see if, if this is still okay, because it feels like I need to seek permission, and that just feels right to me to do that. But, um, and to also seek permission on the right track. But the, the long-term plan is to write a book. So hopefully, you know, the funding will manifest for this. <laughs> and, um, you know, I will be able to write, write and think about all the experiences I've collected and, uh, and the podcast itself. But I'll keep researching and collaborating because this is what I'm loving doing and, um, you know, this project means a lot to lots of other people too. So in the short term, um, I'm about to finish series two and in, so next week, next Sunday, I'm releasing a Halloween Halloween episode, which is a fairy encounter that took place in Somerset. Now, this one is really pokey. If you're, you know, it's not complaining hearted whatsoever, it's really vivid, it's going to stay with you, so just here's your warning. <laughs> but if you're into some really kind of interesting, deep, frightening experiences, you will enjoy this one because it's in the local area, so yeah, very close. Um, but uh, a fortnight after that, I'll be speaking to Dr. Dr. Jack Hunter. So I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's a really amazing researcher um, in this area. And um, he's an anthropological researcher, and he looks into extraordinary encounters and kind of paranormal accounts of high strangeness and the relationship between these phenomena and nature. So I hope that some of you uh, will enjoy tuning into the podcast and, um, you know, Get in touch and let me know your own ideas and what you think about these things. And um, if, you, if you haven't heard it already, then it's available on Apple and Spotify and pretty much on there. But uh, you know, if you've got your own story to tell as well, I'd love to hear from you. And there is this uh, Patreon group, so if you want to support the project, you can join us, which is on Patreon at Mother's Very Exciting Podcast. And we kind of have some um, monthly Discord chats there live chats with each other, that's like an enjoy chat, and then uh, there's also lots of exclusive bonus material on there as well. But um, the main thing is it's just a really nice community of such wonderful people, and yeah, I'm just so grateful to, you know, to have that community there where we can just talk openly and exchange ideas and experiences. So I always end my show with a reminder to remain curious, and I think that's good advice. Um, I think it would be foolish for any of us to think that we're really certain about where we are with all of this because, as I say, it's ever changing. But we need to keep our minds open and our hearts open and just explore together. So, thank you for listening. I think, I was going to say we might have questions, but. Yeah, sure. Fine. Um, yeah, we'll start with the open up the dark box. Just why give me the dark box to anybody who's got seen the animal? Yes, uh, so there were a couple that made it into the book. And um, so one of them was at Wisman's Woods. Basically, some guy had been clambering all over the boulders there, and the cook of the boulders, which are, you know, they're really precious and need to be protected. And he felt someone shove him off. And he, he said to the woman that had let me know about it, he said, I didn't fall, I actually felt like someone had pushed me. And she said, yeah, well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> we shouldn't have been clambering on the boulders. And um, another, woman, uh, another woman had said that um, she had been peeling potatoes in her kitchen one night and um, she had tossed, tossed the potatoes into the bin, which she didn't usually do because she was quite conscientious and she would always take potato peelings out of the compost. But she didn't on this occasion. She was in a rush and 
So anyway, she opened a bin and there was this glowing light. And she said, although it didn't turn into a fairy form, she knew it was a fairy. She knew. And, um, you know, she felt like, she felt really bad for not having taken it out to the conference, but it, it frightened her and she just closed the bin. Well, thank you very much for coming along and taking the time to come. Cheers. And enjoy the rest of the day.